Good morning and welcome back to Sunday School at Faith, um, Faith Presbyterian Church. Today we're going to be going into Revelation chapter 6 um, and learning about the first six seals on the scroll that we discovered in chapter 5 last week. So join with me as we begin uh, reading in chapter chapter 6. Get the right screen up there for you. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given unto him, uh, given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another and there was given unto him a great sword and when he had said and when he had opened the third seal i heard the third beast say come and see and i beheld and lo a black horse and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand and i heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny and thou see thou hurt not oil hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened forth the fourth seal I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed him, followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain, for which the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren and that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. And behold, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth their untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And said unto, to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the faith, face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? All right, and that is chapter 6. We'll start, uh, as always, we'll be using um, an outline from the Blue Letter Bible, which will be linked in the description below, to give us a, uh, a path to follow and something to um, study here. So we begin this chapter with the uh, the scroll that the lamb only the lamb is worthy to open as we learn in chapter five and he begins by opening uh, the first seal and we're going to take a look at the first four seals to begin with here uh, which brings forth uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse as we're probably used to hearing them referred to um, so we'll begin with uh, verses one through two um, the white horse uh, brings a man of conquest uh, from the previous chapter, we understand this scroll is the history and the destiny of mankind and creation, and that only Jesus the Lamb had the right to loose the seals on the scroll of the culmination of history. And if the scrolls detail the culmination of history, then the things associated with the removal of the seals must happen before the scroll is opened. This is not the full fulfillment of history itself, but the preparation for it. And the actual culmination will be detailed out in Revelation 19. Um, and then... 
each seal itself, uh, as we saw, is associated with one of the living creatures who will call out come and see, or uh, other translations is uh, go forth. Um, and it is uh, also a bit, uh, it's one, it's to John to come and see, and uh, in other translations it's calling out to the horseman to go forth and do what they're supposed to do. And then the white horse himself, the behold the white horse, if one were to take the interpretive clues more from a cowboy movie from the Bible, it would be easy to believe that the rider on the white horse is Jesus. However, Jesus does not return. Uh, Jesus does return on the white horse in Revelation 19, 11 through 16, but this is a satanic dictator who imitates uh, Jesus. Uh, and he rules, uh, he has given a crown, uh, but he rules with a bow instead of a sword. And he exercises dominion over the earth, went out conquering uh, and to conquer, and the results of his rule, as described in the following verses, show clearly that it is not the reign of Jesus, uh, rather one that is power hungry. Um, and it, you know, he goes out to conquer, uh, conquering and conquering. Uh, if we take this to be the final satanic uh, dictator over men, we see that he will be more terrible than all previous dictators were. He will rule over men as a false messiah and lead man to organize rebellion against God in the pattern of Nimrod. Uh, Nimrod, his first predecessor, and this is the person uh, that is typically referred to as the Antichrist um, by the Christian religion. And the idea that a satanic dictator over men goes back all the way uh, to Nimrod, the ruler over Babel in Genesis 10, 8 through 14, where it says that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, this has uh, the sense that he was a mighty hunter of men and that his offense, um, that was the offensive to the face of God. And then in verses 3 through 4, we find the red horse. Um, now, this rider did not need to bring war and destruction. Uh, there are many times when um, he is called the, the um, horse of war uh, and similar. But uh, as we read it, he, he takes peace away. <clears throat> All he had to do is take away peace from the earth. And once the peace was gone, uh, the people of earth... You know, they, they fall to war. Uh, peace between men and among the nations is a gift from God and it is not a natural state of relations between men. And so when you take that peace away, take away that gift, they naturally fall to war. Um, and an interesting part here, and it was granted, um, if we read that phrase again, it was a granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth. This is an authority that's being uh, granted to him. And now we all know that there's only one person that can grant that kind of authority to somebody, and that is God. And so we, we find here that God is granting him this authority. Um, and this is directly or indirectly the judgment of God upon earth uh, by granting this evil being the ability to do this thing as part of God's judgment. And in verses 5 and 6, uh, we get the, the black horse that brings scarcity and inequity or famine. <clears throat> the scales symbolize the need to carefully measure and ration the food and, uh, of course, it speaks to the time of scarcity. Uh, and then the prices are interesting. Uh, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a, a denarius. Uh, in that time, uh, when John is receiving this vision and writing this down, uh, those particular prices that are being outlined, they're about 12 times higher than normal. It means that it would cost a day's wage to buy the ingredients for a loaf of bread. For a single loaf of bread, you have to spend your entire day's wage. Uh, this describes a time of famine when life will be reduced to the barest necessities. And we often, we do see great famine in the world today, yet fewer people suffer from hunger today than 100 years ago. However, understanding the world's precarious ecological balance, it would not take much at all to send the entire world into the kind of scarcity and inequity uh, that is being described in the Bible. So very, very quickly we could have those kinds of prices or that kind of famine going on. But we get another phrase here is, do not harm the oil and the wine. The nicer things uh, will still be available for those who can afford them. Uh, these will still be uh, available, uh, the fancy cars, the uh, maybe the fancy food, um, but these things are being, you know, particular particularly targeted as to not be harmed by this famine. And then we have the fourth horse of the apocalypse. Uh, verses 7 through 8 tell us about the, the pale horse that brings death. 
And this last writer shows that there will be a tremendous death toll from the dictatorship, war, famine, and other calamities described by the previous three horsemen. So the previous three horsemen bring in these situations or, or make way for a situation to arise, you know, the one taking away peace so that war can be, happen and causing the famine. And then death comes in to collect those that are suffering from this or dying from this kind of thing. Uh, in our modern age, uh, we've seen hundreds of millions killed by dictators, war, and famine, and yet all of that will pale in comparison to the death coal coming in the wake of this ultimate dictator. No wonder Jesus said for this time, um, said of this time, for then there will be a great tribulation such as not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. As from Matthew 24, 21. And again, power was given to them over the fourth of the earth to kill. Uh, power is given to the horseman and given by God. Uh, again, he's the only one that can give them that kind of power. Um, and it doesn't matter, you know, throughout what is happening and everything, there's still only one that can give them. And God is still in control. So God is allowing this. God is um, ensuring that this is going to happen by giving them that control. And he still holds the scroll and opens the seals. But he's given power over a fourth of the earth. So um, if, if we to take, were to take that literally, that means that a fourth of the earth's population will die in this uh, time of tribulation and in the aftermath of the dictator and the famine and the inequity. And then the fifth and sixth seals um, are going to be opened next. Uh, verses 9 through 11, the fifth seal uh, brings forth the cry of the martyrs. And these are the uh, the Christians, those who have died and gone before and have already come up to heaven. But they are um, under the altar. Uh, we'll read the, the verse there. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. Um, now, the phrasing under the altar, that these souls were under the altar, emphasizes that their lifeblood was poured out as an offering to God. The idea is drawn from Levit Leviticus 4.7. And he shall pour the remaining blood at the base of the altar of the burnt offering. So it's a position um, where when the blood of a, a sacrifice was um, poured, it, it flowed under the altar. And so these uh, these cries that are coming from under the altar of Jesus Christ indicates that these were martyrs that were, you know, either were sacrificed or self-sacrificed themselves for the word of God, uh, standing up for what they believed in. And so it became martyrs for Christ. <clears throat> it was probably best to see um, the phrase who has been slain for the word of God as the cry of all martyrs for God's truth, uh, anybody that has been killed because of their faith, not merely believers persecuted by the coming world leader, um, the first uh, horsemen. So not just them, but all that have been persecuted. And they cried with a loud voice. Uh, these souls in heaven cried out for vengeance. Um, uh, the, the phrase, until you judge and avenge our blood. We usually do not think of God's people crying out for vengeance. In fact, we are told, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So it's not something that we are supposed to seek ourselves. Uh, however, there's nothing wrong with us praying to God and asking him to fulfill what he has said he will do. Um, they are, in this instance, they are they're making their cry to God and then leaving the matter to him after requesting that he you know, fulfills this. Um, when God's people are perse persecuted, he will set it right. He has said that he will. And it is, um, as I said a moment ago, it's not wrong for us to ask him to do what he has promised to do. In this way, the blood of Abel cried out from the ground for vengeance, from Genesis 4.10, and as did the blood of the unavenged, uh, murders, uh, unavenged murders in the land of Israel, from Numbers uh, 35, verse 33. But it was said to them that they should wait to rest. Uh, these saints were instructed to wait. How long should they wait? And this is a confusing part here. There's many interpretations as to how long they're supposed to wait. Um, and uh, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Um, this may mean that they should wait until all God's appointed martyrs were killed. How many martyrs is that? Is that every person that believes or is it just a set number, a set portion of the total believers? We, we don't know that. Um, another idea is, or because the words number of are supplied by the translators, not the text, it may mean that uh, they wait until the character of the remaining martyrs on earth is perfected and complete. It is a character, uh, the way 
that one lives that makes a martyr, not the way one dies. So there are, you know, just briefly two ideas of what this means. You know, e either there is a set number that God is waiting to, for uh, to die, or there's a set number of people he's waiting to believe in him and live the right way. Not necessarily die, but become that martyr by the way that they live. And then verses 12 through 17, uh, the opening of the sixth seal brings in a cosmic uh, disruption. <clears throat> so in, in the Bible, celestial disturbances such as the, the blotting out of the sun and everything else uh, are often connected with the coming of the Messiah. Uh, we have examples of this from Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Zephaniah, and, and of course Jesus himself all describe such events as part of the uh, being connected to the coming of the Messiah. But the, in particular here, the, the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like, like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth. Uh, it, may be, it may be best to regard these pictures as real, um, but poetic at the same time. So John is not using um, any kind of technically precise language uh, or scientific language or anything like that. He's simply writing down what he sees. Uh, many times we've seen in the previous verses, he is write down what you see. He's being told to write down what you see. So he's not using any particular uh, scientific language. Like there, there are several things that we uh, look at back in the Bible and we can say, okay, well, that was an eclipse uh, when the moon crossed in front of the sun and uh, you know, blotted out the sun. But the, the truth is we don't know for sure if that's exactly what happened or not. That's we experience that now on occasion. But that may not necessarily be exactly what happened. Maybe it is just, you know, God's blotted out the sun. And in this particular case here, uh, being that we are just reading what John has been told to write down, he's writing down exactly what he sees. He has no scientific standard or anything to say, oh, this is, this is the explanation as to why the sun's being blotted out and why the moon is red. Now he's just writing exactly as he sees it. <clears throat> And then all the people are equally brought down and brought low by God's wrath. The judgment is all the more profound because it is the wrath of the Lamb. Um, and these people, they run, they, they call to the mountains to fall on top of them because they want to uh, not only hide from the terror of the judgments, but from the face of him who sits on the throne. And the um, a man by the name Sweet, uh, he says, What sinners dread most is not death but the revealed presence of God. And so that brings us to the, the end of chapter uh, 6. Um, we still have a seal left that we'll get into in chapter 7. Um, but I want to leave you with a couple of, a couple of thoughts and a couple of questions uh, about chapter uh, 6 here. And the, the first question is, how do the seals fit into God's prophetic plan? And I'll read you a couple of potential uh, explanations here. There are many different opinions, uh, but it seems the best way, uh, best to say that the seals, trumpets, and bowls that will be described later are not strictly sequential events. It could be said that chronologically the trumpets do not follow the seals and the bowls do not follow the trumpets in a strict order. The first six seals are a summary of the judgments distributed over the whole book, a brief summary of what will occur in the day of the Lord. Um, up to the time of his actual apocalypse or unveiling uh, in chapter 19. That span begins with the revelation of the Antichrist, the first seal, and it concludes with the revealing of the face of whom uh, who sits on the throne, the seventh seal, which we will get to. And two questions, which I will not give you any um, uh, potential answers on. These are just questions for you to think about. And again, look at the uh, the outline that I'm using to uh, go through this. I I don't use everything from that line. I pick a few things here to try and keep uh, a bit focused. Um, but there's a lot of information and uh, some uh, potential answers to these questions after you've thought of you know, maybe your own answer and then go and look what some other people are saying. The first question, do the seals represent conditions immediately before the end or more general conditions prevailing over a more extended period up until the return of Jesus? So uh, a little bit more explanation of that is, do the events of these seals, or are they going to happen back to back? Or is it going to be over a course of a extended, a longer period of time? Is it going to, is it 100 years? Are we going to get seal one 
now, maybe, and then a hundred years from now, the second seal is broken, or is it all back to back? The second question, the sixth seal concludes with a valid question, who is able to stand? Now, we, we did see um, that everybody is calling for the rocks for the mountains to fall upon them because they, they can't stand. They cannot look upon him who sits on the throne. So who is able to? Uh, that, that, the answer to that one should be fairly easy. Um, uh, there's very few that could stand uh, during that time. But uh, I'll be interested to see uh, if you want to put your answers down in the comments down below. That would be great. Um, and I look forward to seeing you again next Sunday for Chapter 7. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you're able to learn something from today's lesson. We of course would love it if you gave us a thumbs up, subscribe, and share this video with anyone you can. The more shares, the more people hear the Word of God. If you'd like to support the ongoing ministry of Faith Presbyterian financially, you can send checks to PO Box 38, Williamston, South Carolina, 29697, or you can give digitally through GiveLiffy on your Android or iPhone. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon.